A very good morning to everybody. My name is Shireen Idikla. I am the clinical director of Play Street, Bangalore, India. I'm also a speech and language therapist, a feeding therapist, and a movement therapist. Our organization, Play Street, provides educational services to help the child with special needs become independent and live up to his or own potential. We offer parent empowerment programs, an integrated schooling program, and a variety of clinical services. As part of Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, the month of April, we wanted to bring you all the pioneers in the field of autism to guide us and spread more awareness and knowledge. Today is our sixth talk and our incredible speaker for today is Dr. Girija Kemal. Hi, thanks for having me. So Dr. Girija Kemal is an associate professor in the PhD program in Creative Arts Therapies at the Drexel University College of Nursing and Health Professions and the Assistant Dean for Special Research Initiatives. In her Health Arts Learning and Evaluation HALE Research Lab, she examines physiological and psychological outcomes of creative visual self-expression. Dr. Girija currently leads studies examining art-based art approaches to health among cancer caregivers, active duty military service members, and veterans. She has led longitudinal evaluation research studies examining art-based approaches to school leadership, development, and teacher incentives, and won national awards for her research. Dr. Girija has served on the board of directors and is now president-elect of the American Art Therapy Association. She's al she also serves as an advisor and editorial board member of several art and health journals and is a practicing visual artist. Her art explores the intersection of identity and representation of emotion. Dr. Girija, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. We are honored to have you here. Maybe we could start with a few words from you to our viewers. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to hear of your work. And um, I, you know, the arts are in, in many ways universal. They have evolved all over the world. So for us to connect over the power and impact of self-expression and the arts to me is super exciting. And um, I am from India, so to connect back to the country that raised me is um, um, is a privilege and honor. So thank you for having me. Thank you. So let's get started. So today our conversation is about art therapy and its effectiveness for children with autism. So the first question, when we talk about art therapy, are we looking at all forms of art like dance, theater, music, etc.? So that's a really good question. Um, there's many different ways that um, people frame this. So creative arts therapies broadly refers to art therapy, music therapy, dance movement therapy, poetry therapy, uh, drama therapy, and psychodrama. So as you will see, each of these therapeutic uh, approaches is embedded in one art form. So art therapy uh, refers to visual arts and visual self-expression used therapeutically. Music therapy similarly refers to music used therapeutically and in the same way, dance, drama, um, and poetry. So uh, there are specializations in the US, uh, for example, in each of these um, professions. Um, the department that I chair, we have art therapy, music therapy, and dance movement therapy as MA level credentialing um, professions. There's also the idea of something called expressive art therapies, which is um, um, training in using multiple art forms. So expressive arts therapists use uh, a combination of arts uh, approaches um, and you know that demands that you have expertise in each of these arts forms. So for example, um, my expertise really is in visual arts. So I feel competent and comfortable using visual arts in a therapeutic way. I do not feel as competent, you know, uh, in using music or drama, even though, you know, we all listen to music. Um, so those are some distinctions. Um, my specific expertise and what I'll be speaking about today uh, is around art therapy, particularly visual self-expression um, and how we might use it therapeutically. Right. 
and actually that kind of answered my second question but i'm going to ask it in case i you know mm -hmm. i haven't understood it well is there a difference between art therapy and expressive art therapy there is there is so when we say art therapy it's really referring to the profession of um art uh, art therapy where you use visual self expression as a form of like um communication processing making sense of the world so i actually am president now of the american art therapy association which is the biggest uh, association of art therapists worldwide and it's over 50 years old and it has worked to advance um, visual expression and ensuring that credentialed uh, art therapists provide services. Uh, so what, you know, one thing that we often see is people will refer to saying, oh, I'm an art therapist. Um, I use art therapeutically. Those are very different things. So uh, an art therapist is actually uh, someone who has an MA degree, over a thousand hours of clinical experience. Um, it's a credentialed psychotherapy profession. So, you know, um, it's an important distinction. I think uh, perhaps not as well known all over the world. You know, the, when you work with clinical populations, you really, really have to know what you are doing. And um, I'll go into this more in depth as we talk, but I, I did want to highlight that distinction. The difference uh, that you ask, an expressive art therapist is also a credentialed psychotherapist, uh, but they are usually using multiple art forms. And again, I think um, it's absolutely fine, doable, but then the burden is on the therapist to be proficient in these multiple art forms. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go a little deeper then. How is art used as a therapeutic tool? Okay. So um, I think about this a lot. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a metaphor. Okay? okay. So the metaphor I think of is the metaphor of fire. So if you think of, um, you know, what, what can fire do? Fire can give us warmth. Fire can cook food for us. It can protect us from danger. Um, say you're in the wilderness, you, you know, you have fire, it'll protect you from, you know, wildlife trying to, trying to eat you or kill you. Right. Um, it can also, if you have clay, you um, fire it in a kiln, it'll give you pottery. But what if fire isn't contained? What, what happens when it isn't contained? It'll burn you down. It'll burn down your house. It'll burn down your forest. It'll burn down anything inside. I think of art and emotion in the same way. So art is a way for us. What do artists provide for society? They provide a metaphor, they provide a container and a mirror to the things that we are going through. Um, and I do believe each of us has that artistic capacity within us. So when we channel that, when we channel that through a visual metaphor, when we express it in an artistic product, whatever that might be, we engage in this process of channeling our fire, our inner emotional fire, into something meaningful, communicative, productive. Um, art can be tremendously destructive, you know, if it's not channeled in the right way, it's not channeled in an effective way. So I think of it very much as um, a way to contain, manage, and understand our emotional lives. Um, we could do it for ourselves. So if you have an artistic practice, um, it's a way for you to sort of practice channeling difficult emotions, overwhelming emotions. And when we are not able to do that by ourselves, you know, life gets overwhelming. Um, in those times, a therapeutic presence, someone who's a therapist can really help. And that's where um, an art therapist comes in, in a facilitated role when, uh, people have gone through difficult uh, adverse experiences, traumatic experiences, and they are unable to manage the, uh, the stressors and challenges of um, life and, and their inner lives. Does that, does that distinction make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, it's, I mean, I'm learning a lot in just these first three questions. <laughs> so, um, in, so in art therapy, do we focus on the process, the product, or the thought behind it all? Um, primarily process. So 
there are some assumptions that art therapists work with. And this is deeply grounded in human evolution. So um, there's increasing evidence uh, that one of the things that defines and distinguishes humans from other species and other animals is our capacity for imagination and our capacity for creative uh, expression and creative thinking. So what, um, what this process does is help us um, sort of connect things, problem solve um, in ways that, um, that we might not have uh, examined before. Um, I don't know, does that connect to your, to yeah, your question? Yeah. Okay, process, I love that because a, a lot of things that we do, we are always looking at the process. And traditionally, we look at the product of it all, like, is that happened? Is that, you know, is this what you're gonna do? Uh, but I love that it's more process oriented and looking at how did you get there and what, what helped you get there and all those things too. Um, yeah. All right. And I, and I will add over here, I think an Im important um, aspect of process is that it takes away from the pressure of a um, art product so yes, you know, whatever we create is always sort of reflected back to us, but the focus on the process takes us back to the person and the, um, how they are thinking about something, how they are feeling about something and making sense of it rather than whether or not um, the final product is aesthetically, you know, appealing or pleasing or not. Absolutely. Okay. So initially people will find it very hard to express what they're feeling through art. So mm -hmm. how do you build the connection between feeling and expressing themselves through art? Okay. Yeah. So this is a, <laughs> this is a recurring issue. I cannot tell you how many times people have come into our sessions, either our studies or clinical sessions and said, Oh, but I'm not an artist. Maybe this is not for me. Um, oh, but the last time I drew something was when I was in school. I, I can't draw anything anymore. Um, so the first thing I will always say is, one, there is no right or wrong. I'm not judging your artwork in any way. This is really a time for you to uh, work with the materials and um, for us to you know, talk through visual images. And maybe you tell me a story about, sorry, there's like a reflection on the... Um, the camera screen. So I say from the get go that this is really not about the art product. This is really about communications and a way to share your perspective beyond words alone. So um, most psychotherapy, established psychotherapies are talk based, um, but a lot of our experiences are not necessarily things we can uh, put into words. You know, think about all our sensory experiences, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. It's not possible to put words to these things um, as readily and easily. So what art therapy and creative art therapies broadly do is help us communicate all our sort of nonverbal experiences, things for which we might not readily be able to put words. Right. Now, when um, you kind of, you know, answered the next part of the question with the question, which was, do you need some basic skill to do art therapy? Um, but uh, more importantly, you have a picture in your mind, like, I want to paint this, draw this, I want to express this. But I'm, it's not coming out the way I think it will. <laughs> it never does. For me, right? I'm, I know this. Even for me. Yeah. <laughs> I want to draw this, but it's not coming the way I want it to come. Yeah. So does that lead to frustration? And, you know, them kind of just saying, no, I don't want to do this anymore. How would you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is where, um, I, you know, and I said to you initially that, you know, art is tremendously powerful and it is not always... Um, you know, sunshine and rainbows. What it is doing at all times is reflecting back to you something that you're putting out into the world. So even the experience, and I face this too, I have a, an idea of what I want to create and then it never is what I had in mind. But that is information too. It's telling me to accept. It's telling me to struggle with and process disappointment. And it's teaching me um, 
to face something that perhaps I am not comfortable with in myself. Why is this disappointing? Why does something have to look exactly like you imagined? Uh, can you accept that it's going to be different? Well, what does that mean? Did you learn something in the process? Does this mean you're going to go back and try again? Or are you going to give up? All this is information being reflected back to you. And in a session, this is exactly what we would process. Um, I once had a, a young lady in a in a um, session and she she identified as an artist so she put tremendous pressure on herself to create this extraordinary image and as the session was progressing she got more and more and more upset because things weren't looking exactly like um, she had imagined and we spent some time really talking about it why is why does everything have to turn out perfect what kind of pressures are we putting on ourselves and uh, when might be a we allow ourselves to make mistakes and try again and um, to really understand um, our reactions to things it's all information which eventually uh, is going to teach us something more about ourselves right. long answer to your, to no, your question. not at all uh, this is exactly what we we need to hear right yeah. what it's about um, so does finding the right medium uh, play an important role in our therapy absolutely so everyone each of us you know we are all unique individuals we are drawn to different materials and media and the things we are drawn to will also change over time so that the kinds of things i used to like to work with 20 years ago are probably not the things i like to work with anymore um and that's okay too because we are changing as human beings as we learn as we experience things um, and that's the sort of beauty of um, creative expression artistic practice there are so many things we can work with um, natural materials as well as um, man-made materials and part of the fun i think is exploring and seeing what really speaks to you and what doesn't that's information too right okay now we're going to go more into deeper with respect to our theme uh, and why we did this. What about for children with autism? What are ways in which art therapy can benefit children with autism? Yeah, so autism is a, um, it's a spectrum disorder, right? So there's a range of um, behaviors, responses associated, as you well know. And one of the um, one of the ways in which uh, creative arts therapies broadly can help is the nonverbal component. So when um, children with autism might have struggles with communication, uh, self-expression, verbalizations, other forms of expression like visual arts, music, dance, all these help with that communication piece so that we are not just waiting for words for communication you allow the child to tap into something that's a source of strength that um, that is something they have agency over and they have a sense of competence so you don't uh, necessarily um, you give the child a way to connect and you know social connection is important for everyone all human beings so it gives them an, an opportunity to connect with others that they might not have with words the other piece is, um, particularly with art therapy, um, the sensory component, the sensory sensitivities of children with autism. Uh, different art media offer different ways to um, sort of engage with that sensory challenge. And um, especially if children have um, are struggling with focusing or repetitive behaviors, certain art media can help channel that again in, from a pathological behavior to something that's adaptive. You know, think about recurring patterns, think about um, repetitive actions that actually can result in a really meaningful art product that um, otherwise would be seen as like a path pathological uh, behavioral symptom in society. Okay, do you think you could give one example of when you mean that repetitive movement mm -hmm. that could lead to something out of that yeah so for example say um um say there's a certain repetitive behavior where someone likes to scratch right um what if you gave them scratch paper 
where um, you have colors underneath and there's you know, a black paint over, the act of scratching, which might otherwise uh, result in harm or uh, distress, here you're scratching away the paper and you're, you're sort of revealing an underlying pattern. Um, that's one way. Okay. You might do that similarly with clay. If the child is able to tolerate the texture of clay, they might create a repetitive pattern, which um, can end up being like a, you know, like a panel or some kind of um, visual piece where the repetition actually becomes a design in itself. Yeah. So it reflects back something that's not necessarily a problem, but like, oh, you know, here's this recurring design that is coming up for me. Oh, that's similarly cool. with coloring, similarly with um, um, any kind of uh, sort of filling in space uh, that reflects back to you uh, something meaningful. And that's such a nice way to take away from, oh, this is a problem yeah. uh, behavior to, oh, you can do so much with that. Right. Uh, and building that sense of competence that way, that's um, really beautiful. But mm -hmm. some of our children uh, with autism have severe difficulties with coordinating their motor movements and fine motor mm -hmm. skills to hold mm -hmm. a paintbrush or a pencil or some you know, art medium, not just the sensory, but the motor wise also that they have difficulty. What could be done in those cases? Here again, I think you, uh, the, the beauty of artistic materials and a facilitative presence is that you um, give them a, you know, Give them the space to explore and try things out. And the more um, children have space to play and explore, the greater their level of confidence. So here, what are they doing here? Here they are exploring something. They're exploring um, um, media. They're exploring actions that are not necessarily resulting in anything negative or, um, okay, it's not necessarily resulting in anything deeply productive, but just the act of trying it out and gaining mastery, even over like one thing, right? Maybe it's a really fat crayon, but gaining that sense of mastery is giving them confidence inside, right? You know what? I took this really fat crayon or chalk. I created this repetitive pattern this is something I can do. This is something I can manage. And this is something that gives me a sense of control in a very, very sort of broad way. I can take that into other challenges into my life. And that this is something we've seen in all our studies is when people go through an art therapy session, they are actually problem solving through that session. They're making a series of decisions around what they are creating what the end product is and what the experience meant for them. And they take that sense of competence into the world after that. And children do it the exact same way in a much, uh, not in as complex a way, but even the simple act of making a series of choices. I have three crayons, I choose one and I do something with it. That Just that simple act has given me a sense of agency. So. I would say really sort of um, allow children to explore and gain that confidence in what I think mostly is a harmless, um, playful experience. And I mean, they have to be old enough to understand, you know, some things you can't put in your mouth and things like that. But overall, that time to play and explore without consequence, without any sort of implications is very, very essential for kids. And you could take them outside. You, they could do this with natural materials. Um, if again, um, I think children with autism with, on the autism spectrum also have sensitivities that we should be attentive to. But within that range of what they find tolerable, um, that play and that exploration is really key. Right. Now, is there an age when you can start art therapy for children? No, you can start with as, you know, as young as you like. And that, especially for younger children, um, it, you know, the inclusion of family members, uh, parents, guardians, siblings becomes really key. I think you, you just have to be careful. Some art media are, you know, you should just be careful. It doesn't go into their mouth um, or they don't <laughs> eat it. But um, 
uh, there's a whole uh, sort of developmental trajectory of our self-expression. So children always start with scribbling and then drawing a human figure, like a very crude human, human figure, to increasingly uh, bringing other people into, the, into their drawings, drawing surroundings, and then you know trying to get to more realistic representation. So this trajectory of our ability to express ourselves visually is fairly consistent, um, sort of like our trajectory of cognitive development, emotional development. So you know you you see a child as young as one or two is is, is trying to scribble and trying to um, make their mark in the world, and so yeah you can start super young and. Um, um, work together, um, especially right. for autism, the earlier, the better. So uh, the earlier you begin uh, uh, interventions and supports, uh, the better uh, it is for the child and the family in terms of understanding each other and supporting each other. Okay. Um, so some children struggle, uh, and we have seen this quite often, with ideation, creation, mm -hmm. what to do. So how would art therapy help with that? And would you, um, and how would you start getting them to think on their own? Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges in um, autism is this idea called theory of mind, which is, um, which you're probably familiar with, right? It's the, and this is what um, most human social development is founded on. The idea that I have a mind, but others have a different mind. So this is the origin of empathy and understanding and communication that I'm coming from this place, but I recognize that you might be coming from a different place. And this is often really hard for children with autism. And it's something it, that it takes a while to learn. Um, there's a lot of work done on things like social stories where um, you use images and symbols to help explain situations and context. So um, symbols, if you have, um, if you want to use like magazine collage cutouts, if you want to use photographs, all these can help um, children construct stories and understand even in a, in a sort of simple way that this means this, this represents this. Um, children with autism, you know, feel things deeply and they uh, have rich emotional lives i think it's the it's the connection and communication that really becomes a challenge um, so working with photographs working with symbols um, working with symbols that they create and mirroring it back to them that again is a very powerful way to validate and say yeah you know what i see you i see that this is an image that you create repeatedly let's work with that let's try it in different combinations um they might have certain repetitive actions maybe um sort of recognizing that and mirroring that again validates and helps them feel seen right and so ultimately you do see them creating more on their own because again there's no right thing here right mm -hmm. there's nothing right here and i think that's where the traditional therapy sometimes go or eat because um we are always looking at a product like no you should be painting it this way you should yeah. be drawing this and you should be yeah, painting yeah. that yeah. And, yeah. and then it becomes the product that we are so focused on that um we kind of miss out on the whole process of did you enjoy that um yeah. what did you create and this is so cool and everything else uh, yeah. but oh you didn't paint it this way and your sense I of know. Oh, yeah. right yeah um i love that that they have that freedom to create whatever they want and then you kind of help them build over that that's great absolutely and this is one of the sort of paradoxes of the human condition like when we really accept people children and adults for where they are they will be motivated to strive and change or it's when we don't accept people for exactly who they are and how unique they are that's when i think some of the struggles um come from so you know recognizing the uniqueness the strengths um there are like a lot of strengths uh in children with autism they have an amazing ability to focus often and because they are not as swayed by emotion this is actually an interesting study that was done 
uh, individuals with autism are not as impacted by advertisements because they are not as manipulated by um, the draw to emotion like uh, those without autism um, okay. might be. So there's some interesting strengths we should really pay attention to, the ability to focus, the uh, ability to really, really be um, deeply interested and committed to a few things. All those things can be channeled in, protect, in productive ways. So, you know, it's, it's important that we don't see um, the ASD's uh, condition as pathological. It's um, what would often be called now neurodiversity, this idea that we all have different brains and this is just a different brain working in a, in a different way. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I love that. <laughs> so um, what are some of the practical ways or techniques of art therapy that parents, teachers, therapists could incorporate into daily life? So I think um, parents, teachers, you know the child you're working with best, right? Mm -hmm. So really you should, um, I shouldn't say should, but really understand what they are triggered by, what they are distressed by, but also what are they excited by? So are they excited by um, uh, certain colors? Um, are they excited by animals? Are they excited by certain stories or characters and stories? Give them the opportunity to communicate through those um, preferred interests and uh, uh, preferred characters. So if they like to draw, you know, keep um, drawing materials handy, keep it with you wherever you go. If you are aware that certain things set them off, um, make sure, I mean, you can't control everything in life, right. right? But expect that this will happen. So the more we understand the strengths and um, challenges the child is um, struggling with, the better we are able to support them. And for parents, I, I would also say, you know, seek out a, a community of support for yourself. It's incredibly hard. Um, so it's not, you know, yes, the child has needs, you know, there's financial, there's educational needs, all those are demanding. Um, but make sure that you take care of yourself too. So um, parents, teachers, this is incredibly draining. Um, how are you taking care of your own needs and you and not sort of completely losing yourself um, in the care of um, your right. child or your student? So um, for a child, I'm just giving an example mm -hmm. because we come, we come across children who are, you've put crayons there mm -hmm. um, and you know, they're quickly like, oh, biting, oh, this yeah. is interesting. Yeah, <laughs> putting it in their mouth. So would you say that, okay, that's maybe not the medium we want to start with and we want to mm -hmm. kind of explore more mediums and mm -hmm. um, look at, like, so what are the other possibilities that parents could look at then or, or th teachers could look at? What should I introduce to the child? Yeah, so you could, so those, that's really for um, either younger children or, you know, developmentally, children who are younger. Uh, one way around that is to actually use food as art materials. So you could use different colored foods um, and have them arrange it in ways that are meaningful. And, and you don't mind if it goes into their mouth as well, like chopped up vegetables, you could use chopped up fruit. Um, you could use, <laughs> my daughter used to um, make things with soup, like, you know, I would turn around and she'd pour it out and do things with soup and I was like, yeah, it's okay. Um, that's, that's how they learn, that's how they process. And um, if, if the child does not understand that the art media should not go into the mouth, uh, we probably, they're probably not ready to really sort of be playing with it. But you know, they learn, you can teach them, you can reinforce the message. This is for this on the paper, not to put in your mouth. Um, that's one way. Um, the other is to sort of work together. So you are with, you know, you're working together with the child and you're teaching them the difference between different uh, sensory tools, sensory experiences, which things go in the mouth, which things don't. 
um, and really sort of helping them see um, and understand the world and how that intersects with us as humans. Um, yeah, I, the, some of this is really, really hard. I, I you know, hey. some of this is really learned through repetition, through um, kind of explore, and explore and figure out what works, what doesn't, but don't get stuck saying it only has to be this way, but keep exploring. Right. Yeah. And, you know, especially for younger children, make sure anything you have is not toxic. So even if it goes in, like it's not toxic stuff. So water based usually is a good idea. All right. So um, instead of just focusing on the skills, what are ways that we can make? Because I know, you know, I've, I've seen it time and again. We tend to focus so much on the skill of it, like do this, do that, do this, do that. But what is a better way we can make art more therapeutic in daily life? Are you talking about, um, are you talking broadly or specifically for autism? Specifically right now for autism. Yeah. I, I think what I had mentioned before around offering a range of media. So um, really seeing what the child is drawn to. Um, some children might be drawn more to markers. Um, we talk about it in art therapy as a um, the spectrum of art media. So from structured to unstructured. Structured things are things that you can control better. Pencils, pens, uh, felt tip pens, um, markers, fine tip markers. Um, um, all these are things that you have control over. Now, at if you move further to the unstructured spectrum, you have um, crayons, um, oil pastels, uh, dry pastels, and then you move to watercolor paints, clay. All these are things that are harder to control. Okay. So it's generally a good idea to start with structured media, things that children have a sense of control over, pencils, pens, things. And as they... Um, are able to tolerate it, you give them more media to try out and some children will be really drawn to it and um, others will be like, you know what, no, I'm just going to um, stick with the things I have a sense of agency over. And part of the um, challenge um, or I would say opportunity in, in uh, children on the spectrum is really helping them understand and self-regulate with art materials. So. Um, if something is distressing, you know, maybe to pull that back um, and then maybe introduce it again a little bit later and see if that's something they want to respond to. Again, we want to sort of um, help them develop that self-regulation through art materials, through physical media. That if something is distressing, you learn to manage that and then maybe step back or choose an alternative uh, approach that helps you tolerate that distressing emotion. Because this is often what happens um, is that children on the spectrum, they get overwhelmed with certain sensory experiences and their way of coping is some of these repetitive uh, compulsive behaviors. And to help them understand and to help us understand you know, some of this like sort of close attention to responses to media is a way, I think. Okay. So when um, um, a child comes to you for the first time, right, uh, your first meeting with them, mm -hmm. would you put the structured material out first and then look at, or would you just kind of go with the flow of them exploring maybe the area mm -hmm. more and you see that they're interested in something else? How do you kind of figure out? Yeah. Yeah, so with children, um, broadly, I spend a lot of time really observing, right? So really, um, firstly, you know, really understanding them and what the parents have to say about their um, um, about their perspective on the child, any in information from the teacher. And then I really observe how does the child respond to a space? Do they um, run into a space and it you know, run around indiscriminately, or they, are they really cautious? Are they really observant and coming in closely? Are they a child that's really um, um, shy and contained, or is this a child sort of, you know, running out into the world? Um, those things help me decide what to bring out. But 
firstly you know art materials wouldn't be the first thing I would set out to do first I'd really sort of observe and depending on um, how they respond and how sort of outgoing or contained or reserved they are I would put out um, typically I would put out structured materials first because it's it's a good idea always to sort of start in a contained manageable way and not get overwhelmed um, and then I would really let the child uh, sort of while assuring that the space is safe so it's my job and as an adult to make sure that the child is safe and the space feels safe um, I would introduce myself I would um, invite them to introduce themselves to me depending on how verbal or non they are and um, communicating my presence in a non-threatening way so um, I wouldn't you know I myself have to be really calm and contained to create a space that feels safe and responsive and then steadily sort of have the child uh, lead by giving me clues on what it is they would like to do um, and I sort of respond to that um, in the moment and um, going from structured materials allowing them to engage with it and then I might have some questions or uh, I might have them depending on how communicative they are to tell me a story about what just happened or what they created and treat it really as a way to um, build a connection build a relationship assuming that this is steadily going to evolve and for session one really my goals would be to ensure that you know the child feels safe and um, this is a space where they are accepted fully for who they are yeah, absolutely. Feeling safe is always first and foremost before we go anywhere. Okay. Now, if parents had to, you know, try and explore, mm -hmm. be with their child, be regulated with their child. Um, I know because a lot of times what happens is it's going to like, okay, I want them to paint this and I want them to use these colors. And, you know, it tends to go there. But yeah. if parents want to take a step back, okay, let me just explore. Mm -hmm. And the child, again, because of so many experiences that they've gone through, um, it's like, oh, mama's trying something, it must be work, and I want to run in the opposite direction right mm -hmm. now, you know, and they don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give parents at that point of time saying, what could you do to encourage this to build mm -hmm. further? So I think <laughs> this is where parents also have to make some choices. Right. Um, one way to do that I would say is really identify is there a space in your home or in your life where um, you can kind of play freely so it might be a table that you set aside it might be a corner in some room somewhere which is a play area where um, the child can explore freely it could be um, maybe you take a little kit and you go outside and you have um, you know a park nearby um, a playground someplace but you have to decide as parents which parts of your house or life and space are play spaces which means these are places to truly explore and which are places that are not so i think it's good to set some boundaries like this is the living room of the house this is the kitchen these are not places to go do whatever you want these <laughs> these are places to and boundaries are really important there's no there's no reason not to set very clear boundaries setting boundaries is part of safety right so uh, these behaviors are not acceptable these behaviors are, are acceptable you can play in this space you not so much in this place so um this is where i think parents really have to sort of self-reflect and um decide which are the sort of exploratory areas which ones are not and um, recognize that this is really hard to do this is not easy to do and um, recognize that this will take multiple steps a long time and um, but you want the best for each other the child absolutely depends on you to set that boundary and set that space and you as a parent um, owe it to the child to let them sort of fully be themselves somewhere in their life and in the, in the home. And you decide what that space would be. 
so example in my house we have um, a table an art table where um, it was originally my art table but now it's the <laughs> it's my daughter's art table and that's okay we also during COVID times we said all right we'll paint our doors we've made paintings on uh, different doors in the house and we decided like the doors would be our sort of play space would be our canvas um, but that doesn't mean every wall in the house is a canvas it's not um, we've defined the space and we had fun doing that so uh, you know the parents really set that boundary create that space and um, don't hesitate to play yourself right it's uh, it's easy to get caught up in the stresses of life and but make that time to play with your child as well absolutely and i think that that was what i was going to ask you Ness. like it's beneficial not only for the children with mm -hmm. also the caregivers and other family members um, and that's what you've been saying, that they need to take care of themselves too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you don't look after yourself, you won't be able to do anything more with your child. Mm -hmm. And this is a medium they could use mm -hmm. to, for their self-expression, to let, Absolutely. let those emotions out, whether it's a frustration, whether it's anger, uh, you know, sadness, whatever it might be, that they could use this medium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But again, without this thing that it has to be a particular way that just let yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. And just like we talk about the communication needs of children with autism, parents have, you know, their struggles are no less. I don't want to minimize it in any way. So um, keep a journal, you know, doodle if you must. Um, uh, find ways for you to channel your um, frustrations, struggles as well, so that you don't take it out on your child. It's inevitable. I think we all, you know, we're all human. We've all yelled at our kids. It's uh, it's a given. But um, be aware of that and as best you can um, channel it in a way that is um, adaptive, not maladaptive, as best we can. So I had uh, one more question, one last question. So what advice would you give parents and professionals who get so lost in the doing of a program, of anything, like even if it's art therapy, get lost, no, I was supposed to do this, right? Instead of being present with their child and integrating art is a more natural expressive form, what mm -hmm. advice would you give uh, these parents and professionals? Yeah, that's so true. And that not that, you know, applicable to all of us, right? Like we get caught up in like the the shoulds and the should haves and um, the best way I find it to um, respond to that is to be really attentive actually to your body and your senses. So um, whenever you feel kind of really frustrated or struggling or feeling like you're trying to control things but they're not in your control, really pay attention to where you feel that in your body. And you know, are you feeling you know it in your shoulders, in your in your in your chest, in your stomach, um, in your head? Where are you feeling it? And really come back to the moment. Um, some of this, you know, is is uh, discussed a lot in mindfulness-based approaches. But what I find really helpful is when you come back to your senses. Okay, what what am I feeling in my body in the moment? also bring bring it back to your senses what what am i do i smell anything do i see anything do i hear anything again it brings you back into the moment and use that as a way to sort of check yourself and say okay what do i need um what do i need and what are the things that will get me out of this um out of this sense of distress or um feeling overwhelmed or you know feeling like i have to control things because there's very little we can actually control in life, right? We really have to sort of learn to manage our responses. So um, I would say really kind of practice that pause uh, to reflect, to come into the present through your senses and um, identify things that you enjoy. So um, are there sites you enjoy? Are there activities that you enjoy? And make sure you go back to them. So... Um, again, you have um, a sense of like your own life and agency over your life as best you can, despite all the challenges that come our way. 
which they surely will. So even simple things, for example, for me, it's looking out of this window and I see like the first blooms of you know, spring. There's a cherry blossom tree outside, which is um, it's in full bloom. The tree that's outside, you know, the first buds of spring are coming out. These things, like when I stop to notice these things, it gets me down from like, down, like not down in a bad way, but uh, brings me um, to a like level of like stability rather yeah. than being, you know, frenzied and harried. It's right. like, it gives me pause, like, gosh, there's beauty out in the world. And that is a way, for me personally, that's a way to sort of calm down. So I would encourage parents really to identify those things. What are the things that help you self-regulate and manage yourself? Exactly the kinds of things you want to teach your child. Right. Okay. And that brings us to the end of this conversation. And on behalf of Play Street team, I'd really like to thank you uh, again for joining us and for sharing your valuable time and knowledge with us. I hope all the viewers are really able to understand how art can be used as a modality for your loved ones to express their feelings, emotions, and so much more. And not just for them, but just yourselves too. Today was just a very brief introduction into art therapy, but there's so much more to explore and we hope you all will. I hope Dr. Girija has sown the seeds for all of you on the benefits, uses, and ways you could all start with using art as a form of self-expression. Like I said, not only for your loved ones with autism, but also for you as caregivers and professionals. We all need to look after ourselves too. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Take care and goodbye. Thanks for having me.